friends, welcome to Making Disciples. My name is Chris and I am your host. I hope that you've had a good week. I'm praying that you're going to have an amazing week ahead of you. Uh, in today's episode, we are just going to look at two uh, pieces of the created order, the world that we live in, and just see how they apply to two bits of scripture. Um, this, in some ways, is a short thought. It's a short thought that I hope makes you go, wow, I wonder where there are other examples of this in the world. And so I'm going to just share two stories with you, two things with you, and link them with two pieces of scripture. And I'm really hoping that it makes you go, wow, isn't God incredible? Um, before we get there, a couple of things. You know, I'm putting this episode out. I think it'll be something like the 25th of February, 2024. We're fast approaching Easter. And Spring Harvest is on the horizon, the conference that I lead. Now, for some of our international listeners, yeah, it's hard for this to apply for you, but Spring Harvest is fast approaching. It's incredible Bible week, Holy Spirit week, where we uh, connect with Christians from all denominations in the UK and in Europe. We gather, Minehead and Skegness, and uh, we spend some time in worship. We we read scripts together. There's Bible teaching, amazing youth work. Uh, the conference is fast approaching. I, I think Skegness is pretty much booked, booked, booked up. Uh, I think there's only a few spots left there. Um, Minehead has uh, some places left, not many. So if you would like to join us this Easter, then then do get booked in quick. Uh, that would be uh, so much fun. I'm going to be Bible teaching in Skegness hanging out in Minehead. So if you're a, a podcast listener and you're going to be at Spring Harvest, then do come over and say, hey, I'm, I listen to the podcast. Uh, and, you know, we might even have coffee together. Can you imagine that? So Spring Harvest is fast approaching, so do get that into your diary. Um, just want to, you know, the Bible book by book has now been out for a couple of years and just had some really good reports from uh, podcast listeners who have bought copies and just find it really helpful for personal Bible study uh, and for your own sermon prep, youth work prep, that kind of stuff, small group prep. So just to encourage you, if you've not got a copy of the Bible book by book, you know, I know I wrote it, but I can't more highly recommend it. I think it's probably the the defining book uh of my kind of writing career so just kind of to to mention that let's jump in we're going to look at two different stories or two different analogies and connecting with the bible and what i want to do here is just show you how the universe is hardwired to agree with scripture the universe is hardwired to agree with scripture so you know we're not going to be talking about creation and creationism because I would argue that science actually helps us to agree with scripture I'm not going to look at that one but I'm going to look at a couple of other examples now as I look at these if you go hang on Chris I think there's another one you missed this one this is a really good one over here I'd love to hear your examples of this um, because I think I'd love to create a list of these kind of things where we see creation backing up the gospel or backing up scripture so if you know an example Send me a direct message through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, because uh, I would love to hear your examples. So don't go, oh, this was nice, and move on. Give me your examples. I'd love to hear. So let's jump in as we look at how the created order, the created world, backs up Scripture. So let's jump in then as we look at how creation in the created order backs up scripture and the first one I, I want to look at is this let me tell you a story first so a number of years ago a member of our congregation worked at the uh, London Zoo incredible zoo in London and they said hey you know do you want to come with the kids and you and Becky kind of get like a back um, a tour through the pack and back side of the zoo you know i'll take you into the compounds where the animals are and we'll show you uh, how the animals live outside of what's on show I'm like, oh how amazing i was super excited because uh, we were going to get to see some armadillos and the armadillo is my my spirit animal i just absolutely love the armadillo hard shell on the back soft on the front God spoke to me a number of years ago about how that was how I'm meant to be in ministry. I have a hard shell for the, for the threat, um, 
flaming arrows of the evil one, but soft on the front as you minister and you pastor people. Uh, so I was super excited to go to the London Zoo and she was taking us around. We got to see uh, really all the enclosures and the other side of the enclosures, which the kids absolutely loved. And as we were going around, uh, there was a couple of the enclosures where I noticed that the animals were not on show and they were essentially out back away from the eyes of the public. So I ended up saying, you know, why is it that the meerkats and not on show today. Like, why is that? Why is it that the elephants today aren't on show, but they're obviously here, and they're not sleeping. They were kind of pottering around out back. So why is that? And she was able to say to us, well, uh, pre-Sunday opening, when everywhere had to shut in the UK on a Sunday, animals were out Monday through Saturday, but on a Sunday, the animals would have a day off from the public eye. And it wasn't that the animals were on their own, the zookeepers were there, but the animals were able to be themselves. They were allowed to go wherever they wanted in the front or the back compound. They, they could just do whatever they want. On a day when the zoo's open, they want to try and get the animals out in view of the public. There's nothing worse than walking around a zoo where you see nothing because all the animals are hiding. So you would want um, the animals to be, able to be out front Monday through Saturday. Uh, but then on a Sunday, the animals would be away from the eyes of the public. And when Sunday trading happened and zoos start to open on a, on a Sunday, what they noticed was that the animals were getting somewhat depressed. I don't know if that's quite the right word. You know, there might be a better word in, in zoology. But what they noticed was the animals would be getting depressed. The animals were just becoming very lethargic, being on view every single day of the week. And what they realised was animals needed a day off like we need a day off animals need a day off so what they decided was that they would have a rotation where different animals would have a day off on different days so although the zoo was open every day of the week that the zoo would not have animals on show every day of the week and that the animals would take it in turns for their day off so the zebra, you could say, would have the Tuesday off. The meerkat would have Wednesday. The tortoises would have Thursday. You know, that kind of idea, the lion's Friday. And it, it would rotate in that way. And by doing that, what they noticed was the animals weren't depressed. That they, by having time away from the eyes of the public, it actually changed their mood. And it changed the way that they engaged with the public. So they realised that hardwired into... Again, you know, essentially the creation of the animals, the order of the animals, the animals needed Sabbath. The animals needed a day off. And that hardwired into the cosmos uh, is this rhythm of needing a seventh day off, Sabbath. Genesis 2, 23. On the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested uh, from all his work of creating. So God rests. Does God rest because he's tired? God doesn't get tired. God rests because he, you know, it's hardwired. That actually making, creating and resting is a rhythm. Within Judaism, there were rules around sabbath and these rules were not just for people they were also for animals animals also sabbathed and the animals were not to be made to work on the sabbath day the animals would rest like humans um i'm just going to read some text out here from a jewish uh, text so let me just read this to you in both cases, it is forbidden to sell something to a non-Jew. This is writing about the Jewish life. Rather, Jews are prohibited from putting Sabbath observant animals into a position where they will have to break the Sabbath. In other words, this is not me, other words, this is text. In other words, this prohibition concerns the animal and not just the Jew. 
Not all animals are used for work. Small animals such as sheep and goats are not used for work. Therefore, in a place where it is customary to sell them to non-Jews is permitted. And kind of goes on. But this idea that working animals were to be given the Sabbath rest just like the, the humans. That's hardwired into Judaism. I just find that really interesting that, that the Jews had this practice of Sabbath and the animals were also to Sabbath. And now we have a situation where zoos are realising actually for the well-being of animals, animals too need to Sabbath. So there's something here about the created order that backs up scripture. And I find that really enthralling when you see it hardwired into the created order and therefore the, the, the God thing, the spiritual thing, is seen in the created order. I want to give you another example and then I'll, I'll give us something to, to kind of go away and think about. So what I want to talk about is John 1.29. This amazing little bit where John, the prophet, uh, says this the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him this is at Jesus's baptism and John says he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world you know within the biblical world Jesus is the Lamb of God and the blood the blood of the spotless lamb becomes the thing that takes sin away from the world so it's through Jesus's death and resurrection it's through Jesus's blood that we are cleansed and freed I want to tell you a story I came across recently, and I hope you find this as interesting as I did. Because you might, of course, everybody knows this. Like, what, what, what you, what you're so surprised about? You, you know, you may know this. I didn't, and this is what I found so enthralling. So there was a farmer, and he tells a story. Real farmer he tells a story about uh, being a sheep farmer, and his one of his sheep gets bitten by a rattlesnake and he wrote about his experience of what happened with the rattlesnake be, uh, biting the sheep let me just read this to you he wrote a rattlesnake bit one of my sheep in the face about a week ago uh, kind of small print uh, the rattlesnake is one of the most deadliest of snakes okay so the deadliest snake that lives around he says the sheep's face swelled up and hurt really badly but the old rattlesnake didn't know the kind of blood that flows through a sheep anti-venom is most often made from sheep's blood the sheep's face swelled up for about two days but the blood of the lamb destroyed the venom in the serpent I was worried, but the sheep didn't care. She kept eating, kept on drinking, and kept on climbing because she knew she was all right. Often the serpent of this life will reach out and bite us. They inject their poison into us, but they cannot overcome the blood of the Lamb of God. Now, I'm going to read the next bit in a second, but get this. So I didn't know this, that chemically, sheep's blood is used to make anti-venom and that when a sheep sheep's blood is mixed with the venom of a poisonous snake it it creates this anti-venom it creates antibodies in the blood the lamb's blood that then is used to create the anti-venom that is used in human beings so when a human being gets bit you give them anti-venom the anti-venom is made from the blood of, the, of a lamb which I just find out standingly spectacular so it carries on often the serpent of this life will reach out and bite us this is the farmer still they inject their poison into us but they cannot overcome the blood of the lamb of god that washes away the sin of the world and the sting of death don't worry about the serpent or his bite just make sure that the blood of the lamb is throwing flowing through your veins i just thought it was a really interesting kind of observation from this farmer so I did some more Googling. I was like really interested by this and I ended up in a medical journal. It says this, lambs have robust immune systems and produce powerful antibodies that can bind to snakes' venom, uh, enabling our own immune systems uh, to be defended uh, from these toxins. Antivenoms are 
obtained by harvesting and then purifying the antibodies from the plasma produced by the donor animal. Snake antivenom is a medication made up of antibodies from lamb's blood. So, get this, the blood of the lamb is a antidote to the uh, to the death bite of the snake. Insane. So when we say things like here is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, literally the blood of Jesus, the lamb, is the antivenom for sin itself. You know, where does sin come from? It came from the lies of the snake. The, 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 um, the bite of Satan, the snake, intoxicates us with a toxin that will bring about death. Sin leads to death. But the blood of the lamb creates an antibody that saves us from the bite of Satan himself. Drop, drop the mic moment for me. I'm like, what? So not only do we as Christians say the blood of the lamb uh, the blood of the lamb takes away the sin of the world but hardwired into the world is that very thing that the blood of a lamb creates antibodies when bitten by the snake creates antibodies that then saves the lamb and then can end up saving us when Jesus was bitten by death on the cross his blood became the anti-venom for death itself which he shares with us and now we are saved from death itself because of his blood so hardwired into snakes and lambs the behavior of the blood and the venom and the anti-venom is what we live out in scripture and live out in salvation i love this so you think Satan's bitten your life and you're cursed. You think uh, Satan has bitten your life. Nothing good could come of it. You think Satan's bitten your life and sin's going to win. The tomorrow is going to be the same as yesterday. You think uh, Satan has bitten your family and it's falling apart. You're cursed. You're in debt. There's nothing good could come of your life. That is it. You are done. And death is only around the corner but the blood of the spotless lamb says there's antibodies here in the blood of the lamb that kills death itself you might think that satan has bitten you and that death is coming but the blood of the spotless lamb is an anti-venom to death itself dude I am I'm I can't wait to preach this I feel like there'll be a time when this is my right hook in a sermon and you're hearing me just for the first time kind of brewing this amazing reality that what we see in scripture is seen in the world that it's not just an idea it's something that's true it's just true about the world it's true about how God behaves towards us it's true about Jesus's death on the cross and if you need to see how the blood of the lamb saves us from the snake then just look to what is hardwired in the blood of a lamb that's in a field in the Middle East right now. Friends, my question for you is where do you need God's anti-venom? Where do you need God's anti-venom? Where do you need the blood of the spotless lamb to speak a new truth over your life? Where are you looking to God right now to be the anti-venom for Satan that's got his claws and his tongue into you. For many of us, we feel like we're not good enough. We feel like we've fallen short. We feel like our life is a mess. I'm going to pray for us in a second. I'm going to pray that you may experience the anti-venom of Jesus flowing through your veins. I loved what that farmer written. Let me just read it again. Often the uh, serpent of this life will reach out and bite us. They inject their poison into us, but they cannot overcome the blood of the Lamb of God that washes away the sin of the world and the sting of death. Don't worry about the serpent or his bite. Just make sure that the Lamb's blood is flowing through your veins. Make sure, friends, the blood of the Lamb is flowing through your veins. Let me pray for that to be over you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you 
that hardwired into the created order is biblical truths the reality of what you tell us is true in terms of the gospel of scripture is found in the world and lord we thank you that the blood of the lamb creates an anti-venom to death we thank you that Jesus' blood creates an anti-venom to death. Lord, where we are experiencing the work of Satan and death in our lives, we speak over it in the name of Jesus and we say, Be gone, you have no right in my life because my veins are flowing with the blood of Jesus. And therefore, the anti-venom to death is in my veins. So you are not welcome. You're not welcome over sickness where Satan is making you uh, anxious, where Satan is whispering lies over you, where Satan is is got his uh, tongue into your family, into your marriage, into your workplace. We say no, because the blood of Jesus, the anti-venom of Jesus is flowing through my veins. You are not welcome here. God, would that be true for us this week with whatever we have got going on? May that just be true. We pray that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, until next time, grace and peace. Have a wonderful week. And give me your examples of where you see the truth of Scripture lived out in the world. Until next time, grace and peace.